Uh, I have been living in Iceland for 12 years, but I'm uh, um, originally German. And I'm actually back here in Germany for one year, here in Berlin, which is in terms of cultural diplomacy an extremely interesting experience being back, re-migrating, seeing both my home country and my new country from different perspectives. And I'm, I'm also going to use these different perspectives in my, in my presentations because going back to Germany, I started seeing things in Iceland um, differently, actually appreciating them even more than I did before. Iceland, as you may know, is famous and infamous. Infamous for one thing, it's banks, which we won't talk about today. And famous for two things that has uh, contributed internationally, and I've been so lucky in, in participating in both. One is literature. Um, and the other thing that I think we could export even more is uh, Iceland's legendary standards in equality. Um, there are some attempts to export it. There is a school project at university inviting each year young women from developing countries and it's called Equality School. It's a very, very inspiring and interesting project. Um, I'm working, as Mark mentioned, for an, a migrant association which I helped found and was chairing for a while, um, which is called Women in Iceland. Um, it's very hard work getting that name up because it stands for Women of Multicultural Ethnicity Network. Um, I could uh, present you that organization very, very shortly just by introducing these three uh, women. Uh, a couple of years ago when we took the pictures for a new brochure, we um, came upon this one and I've used it ever since because their stories tell everything that, that we're about. Uh, on the left, you see Lisa from the Philippines who came to Iceland at a time when Filipino women were, as in many countries, booked on uh, low-key service jobs, cleaning or working in fish factories. And she was the first one to pioneer to uh, finish uh, an education as a teacher in Iceland, so the first foreign-born um, teacher. In Iceland, in the middle, um, your countrywoman, Emma Bet, she's from Ethiopia and has an is inspiring story that she's been willing to share with us on behalf of our organization. She was uh, subjected to domestic violence, but with the help of an Icelandic friend, she managed to succumb it and has been a, an incredibly um, inspiring and successful story since. And on the right, there is a young woman, uh, Inka, from Lithuania, who represents the new generation of immigrants to Iceland from Eastern Europe, very successful young businesswoman. Um, and that uh, brings us to what we're about. Uh, a bit more official definition is our aim to unite, express, and address the interests and issues of all women of foreign origin in, in Iceland to bring about equality for them as women and as foreigners. Um, we've heard a bit about that from, from Paloma earlier this morning. Discrimination that we face is, of course, uh, double. We are discriminated as women. We are discriminated as foreigners. And um, we have, from the start, worked very, very closely with feminist organizations in Iceland, have received an incredible support and uh, that, that is why also I will include that aspect on the general uh, women's rights in Iceland in my, in my presentation because it's, it's absolutely closely interconnected and this is the way we saw and um, we decided to go forward. Uh, yeah, our focuses are then of course labor and social issues, education and combating gender violence, as also reflecting in, in the pictures of the young women I showed to you. Um, I'm not going to go into any details about what we're doing. Uh, we are very much, a, you started out as a lobbying group, um, trying to be visible in Iceland. I will show you some statistics. Immigration to Iceland is very recent, very new. 10 years ago, you, uh, a black face in the street would, would, cars, would uh, make people stop their cars and stare. 
um, that has changed a lot, um, uh, very dramatically. And in the recent years, we also went from being simply lobbying group into uh, more social activities, because for us, as those women active, and that, that's something that may, may, many of you who are working in the field will know, um, that it is very, very difficult to reach out to the grassroots, to actually reach the women we want to reach. Uh, we always approach by press, uh, who ask us, oh, can you give me a juicy story of someone who's been subjected to domestic violence? Um, I mean, I don't have these women in my phone book uh, because they don't want to be reached. And uh, so we put a lot of hard effort and different strategies also into reaching these women. And we tried a lot of things from bingo evenings to a lot of different um, activities. Um, we've had some uh, um, strategies worked out for um, courses in self-empowerment for special groups. Uh, this was a, uh, for young um, migrant women. We have had these courses for victims of domestic violence or unemployed women, women and, and developed this course system. Um, we have what we call peer counseling, uh, uh, an area which I've worked in very much. We train women to counsel their peers because although there is inf official information presented by, uh, offered by ministries and, and municipalities, we find that um, there are always problems that uh, migrant women will only want to talk to a fellow country woman in a, in a different non-official atmosphere. So that's what we offer too, and we train these women in how to give counsel. <coughs> we are involved in a lot of artworks, uh, cultural activities. This is a map of Reykjavik, which we redesigned with Aboriginal art uh, and um, our own ideas. Uh, we have a choir. We actually decided, because we were always approached, and why is it only for women, your organization? Um, because simply men do not get organized the way we do. Uh, there are no other transnational organizations for migrants in, in Iceland that way. So we decided to transmit our knowledge, our experience also, and, and, and um, also offered um, courses in that case for Polish unemployed men. And we have uh, uh, book circles, um, story circles as we call them. Um, Iceland is an incredible country uh, in terms of, as I said, um, gender equality. It is the top performer on gender equality according to the findings of the World Economic, Economic Forum, ranked first by the Global Gender Gap Report for four years in a row, followed by Finland, Norway and Sweden. The things this report is looking at are economic participation and opportunity, that means female labor force participation, wage equality and the percentage of women in high ranking jobs. It is educational attainment, which looks at female literacy and how frequently women are enrolled in higher education. At the moment from my university, it's I think 1.5 women for every man in, in, at university. Um, and political empowerment, which looks at the number of women holding political office, as well as the number of female heads of state over the last 50 years. And that brings me to um, looking a little bit back in history, um, because these things don't happen all at once. And it has taken generations to get there where we are. So. Um, in Iceland, which is a, uh, used to be a, a very strong, still is a fishing nation with men out on the sea uh, for weeks, maybe months. And that has strengthened actually women's position a lot already in, 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 in history. And particularly after World War II, um, where many countries such as Germany imported foreign workforce, what Iceland did, they had the women enter the labor market when they really needed workforce. So you have more than maybe one, two generations who have a tradition of being in the labor market. 
I'm going to go back to this labor market participation because I think it is a key, a key factor. So women had already participated in the labor market for decades when in the 1970s they realized that they did not get any attention, they did not get other participation apart from participation in the labor market. So they decided, very low key, um, nobody thought anything would come out of it, um, to go on strike, a national strike of women. And on the 24th of October 1975, 90% of all Icelandic women laid down work. And since that included kindergarten teachers and teachers and nurses, um, schools had to close, so the men had to go home, take care of the children, because the women didn't go home, they took to the street. So they paralyzed the country for one day and made a very, very strong um, impression. Sorry. And um, I think in continuation of, of this day, of this movement, in 1980, we had Vigdis Finnbordotir, who Birgitta mentioned also this morning, the first democratically elected female head of state, and still today, I think the most respected um, person in Iceland. And she has been a real, real support to us also. Uh, this day actually was really great fun. We opened our office and she came. And migrant women that we were, we had not noticed that that day was um, a final in, uh, I think, a European handball um, competition, which Iceland is really enthusiastic about. So there were no Icelanders present, only us, huge crowd of Thai and Polish women. And Victis came and she had the time of her life, she said. Um, so she was the only Icelander attending our event. Um, but it takes more than that, of course. And uh, I'm going to look at a couple of milestones in policy frameworks. Because without legal um, uh, frameworks, this is, of course, not possible. Um, the most important, I think, personally, is the parental leave system. It is a huge factor in equality in Iceland. Uh, this 333 means that uh, the mother gets three months off paid leave after birth. The father gets three months, which he cannot transfer to the mother. And since this is um, pay-related, all the men take it. Over 90% of men take these three months. And three months can be divided, and in most cases, of course, the mother takes it. But this also means that um, having a child does not really interrupt my career. So I'll be, the first year can be, can be covered. And I think this is um, a neglected factor, but a major one in my view, because if you're as an employer have a 27 year woman before you applying for a job or a man, you will not think, oh, this woman will soon be away anyway, because they both will be away, gone for a while and then come back again. So it doesn't matter. So you will employ the one you want most for the job and not think about the gender. I think this is very important. Um, we have gender quotas extended from public bodies to private corporations. Companies with more than 25 employees have to have a gender equality policy in there. Whether and how they implement it is a different question, maybe very often, but still they have to have it. Um, we have legislation criminalizing the purchase of sex. So prostitution is banned by law. We have a ban on strip clubs. Uh, we have marriage equality for same-sex marriages and transgender rights. And uh, maybe many of you know, because this attracted actually more attention abroad than in Iceland, that our prime minister, who just left office last week, was the first openly gay or lesbian prime minister in the world. But the most fascinating thing to me is not that fact, but the fact that no one cared. This was not an issue, not by her supporters, nor by her opponents, they wouldn't have dared. She's a rather private person, she's not a, a, a gay rights activist, she is interested in other things, and this is just her choice and her life, and nobody really cares. That is, I think, the most interesting thing about it. 
Uh, and we recently had the Austrian model of intervention in uh, cases of uh, gender violence. So perfect, uh, yeah, quite close to it, but not actually quite. Uh, what remains is the wage gap and is gender violence. Um, and that applies to migrant women uh, even more than to um, Icelandic women. As I said, th this is closely interconnected, uh, but you can also always add something if you're talking about a migrant woman. Uh, the wage gap is strong, and that is actually one thing that this picture is from 2005, the first women's day off that um, I was uh, involved in. In 2005, uh, women wanted to repeat this great event from 1975, and they're like, oh, what can we do today to activate women? What are they interested in? What will get them to the streets? And we said it's the wage gap. Women still own for the same job only 60 something percent of uh, the wage that a man gets. So it was decided um, 60 something percent of the working day is over at 2.26. So at 2.26 all women in Iceland left work and took to the streets. We had 50,000 women there out of a population of 320,000. So it was huge. Uh, five years later, we repeated the same thing, uh, now focusing on gender violence. Again, um, this is a very uh, large uh, concern for migrant women. Migrant women are, let's say, about 5% of the population, but the women's shelter that we worked with very closely houses a um, 40% of the women staying there are of foreign origin. So these two blemishes on the almost perfect um, image of Iceland in, in equality matters remain, and, but we have been focusing on them for the last couple of years and, and been successful in, in many things. Um, Getting closer to the, the immigrants, as I said, migrant history is incredibly new. Um, particularly if I compare to, to Germany, to other countries, to most of your countries, I guess. Um, Iceland had very small numbers of migrants, uh, very often family uh, migration, uh, women marrying uh, um, Icelandic men, um, rather large population from Thailand, the Philippines, and uh, Vietnam. And, um, but then uh, during the economic boom year, starting as you can see in uh, 2000, about 2004, um, I worked in an intercultural information center at these times, and these years were crazy. We had people coming with their suitcase into our office saying, where do I sleep tonight? Where do I start working tomorrow? Uh, people were queuing out in, in, in the streets. Um, but then we had the economic collapse, and as many um, states thought, um, as Germany thought for a long time, using this term of Gastarbeit, a guest worker, uh, importing workforce when you need them, and when you don't need them, assuming they simply go home, um, of course did not work. As you see, there are still a large number. The number dropped a little, of course, but unemployment amongst migrants in Iceland is much higher than amongst um, Icelanders. Um, but, and this is the point I want to stress today, Icelandic, Iceland still has an incredibly high participation of migrant women in the labor market. We had over 90%, and I believe this is the highest figure in the world, 90% of migrant women are working, are out in the labor market. Uh, very often in low paid jobs, service jobs, etc. But at least we have them there and we can get to them there. And they have at least a minimum of rights protected. So this is a very, very important um, factor. Uh, We have, as I said, a large number of low-paid service jobs. That is uh, the negative things. We have, as I mentioned, also 5% of the population, but 40% of stays in the women's shelter. Uh, the good thing, however, as I said, we are organized. 
Um, we are, our organization very strongly represented. We were taken very well everywhere, invited to uh, uh, be represented in a large number of migrant bodies, uh, in networks, one is called Women of the World, the Immigration Council, the Red Cross, the Intercultural Research Institute, for example. So we get a lot of support, mainly from the feminist movement, but also the labor union movement. We were very early connecting with those uh, two movements for support. And um, we are very happy also that um, we had, just before the change of government, uh, we had um, new immigrant law um, passed just recently. Um, so as I said, I'm back in Germany. What about Germany? Um, I was shocked coming back here, shocked by um, a number of things. Shocked very much by an article I read a couple of uh, weeks ago in the Spiegel. Uh, there, Maria Böhmer, migrant spokesperson of uh, the German government, was talking about that migrant children are insufficient in German when they enter school. I very much agree with that, and I very much agree that this is a problem and that um, we need some action about it. But what did she say was the reason? And that was the thing I was so shocked about. She said, the reason these children have problems integrated, integrating and, and uh, um, being educated is the fact, and that is a quote, they speak a different language in their home. 60 years of organized, organized immigration to Germany, we're no further than that. The problem is the other language at home. The problem is not that we cannot raise bilingual children, that we cannot provide them with a, we cannot give them the, the most valuable asset that you can give to your children, and actually the reason why I'm here for a year now back in Germany, um, is bilinguality. And they say the problem is the other language. Do they really expect people to speak broken German to their children? Do they think that would help? It won't. You need a strong foundation in your native language to be able to learn another language. We all know that. So they are working against this. And I think a major factor and where they are going so wrong here in Germany at the moment, sorry, this is the source, is the fact that they are introducing this new, what they call Herdprämie. For those of you who know some German, that means oven bonus. They are offering women who stay at home and do not send their smaller children to kindergarten money every month. Now, this will not be used by well-educated uh, women who've had a good career, decide in their late 30s to have a child, take very good care and, and uh, um, uh, support these children and, and, and enable them to learn a lot. This will be used, for those women, it won't matter whether they get 150 euros per child a month or not. But this matters to migrant women who have many children, who have anyway only a low paid job, they will stay at home, they will be isolated, their children will not go to, uh, to kindergarten, and they will not be able to speak German when they enter school. So this is the thing I was really, really seeing um, with my, my migrant perspective, both here and, and uh, in Iceland. As I said, in Iceland we have 90% of foreign women on the labor market. We have comprehensive childcare infrastructure from the first months if you choose and if you have to. We have the parental leave system. We do have a quota system, but it unfortunately does not. We are campaigning for that now to apply that also, for example, to qualified migrant women in the public service sector. Um, but as I said, in Germany, we only have a, a, um, we have a lack of child care places. Um, we have only 45% of migrant women in the labor market. And um, as I said, this, this hair premium. Um, and to finish off, um, 
as I said, this comparison and the lesson I've learned and the thing I'm most proud of that um, in Iceland, this framework really does help and it shows, and I think it shows nowhere better than two of three foreign born citizens in parliament were from our board, were women, women in Iceland. One of them even uh, a Muslim woman and this only after, as I showed the graph to you, a couple of years in migration history. Thank you. Thank you.